Um, so I'd like to first off thank you guys for having me here. Um, this is an amazing conference. Um, so far during lunch, someone gave me multiple high fives in a conversation about hypervisors. So I feel like I'm in a room of kindred spirits. Um, just to test that out, who wants to hear about math? <laughs> that would only work here. Okay, great. Um, so I'll tell you a bit about myself, um, and then I'll tell you a bit about the talk, and then I will give you the talk. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm a security researcher first, but then um, also I'm a PhD candidate in mathematics at the University of Waterloo. If you haven't heard of it, it's in Canada. Um, and I work on quantum algorithms for cryptanalysis. So what this means is we look at the difficulty of computational problems upon which cryptography is built. Um, and we find sometimes that the problems that we thought were very hard on a typical classical computer are in fact very easy um, on our proposed quantum systems. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is a bit related to that, but I would like to ground it in um, in programming and thinking about programming languages and systems that we can actually construct. Um, so what I hope you can take away from um, the talk that I'm about to give is an understanding of what, like it's not quite the network stack, but what um, the various levels of abstraction are within quantum computing and how um, a room full of people inclined toward the use of classical, you know, conventional computing could make use of quantum resources for speed ups in their algorithms. Um, so whenever I'm getting a big head about how I um, feel about my research, I have to remind myself that I spend all day thinking about imaginary computers. Um, and that brings me right back down. Um, so quantum computing, uh, as a very simple definition, is using quantum mechanical um, phenomena, so things like entanglement or superposition, to perform computational tasks. Um, why do we do this? Um, it w wouldn't make a lot of sense if it were just as good as the computers that we have because quantum computers are very, very expensive and so far we have, um, you know, 15 or so qubits and that's maybe not as useful as what we're looking for. So um, why do we have these very expensive computers? Because we think that we can have some um, trade-off and um, have less computationally expensive algorithms. So this is only true if we can scale it up. So. Um, to be useful, a quantum computer needs to scale, but this is really challenging because the things that make a quantum computer um, useful are the exact things that are getting in its way. So quantum computers are really sensitive to environmental noise. Um, if we have a qubit in a room and someone walks down the hall um, in a non-specialized building many floors away, it will disturb our qubit and it will collapse and maybe we're not done our computation. So we have to have very specialized buildings. Um, another thing is we have a challenge um, with measurement in quantum systems. So when we measure a quantum state, we destroy a superposition, which is something I'll explain. Um, and then it's really hard to create memory. Um, and then beyond this, um, there's some other things, but I don't want to use too much time. So I stole this from Scott Aronson, who is a phenomenal physicist. Um, quantum mechanics in one slide. Um, you can think of quantum mechanics as being probability theory, but you're doing it over the complex numbers. And this allows us to compute things in a really interesting way. Um, so the basic unit um, for a quantum computer is a qubit. So we have regular bits, we have our ones and our zeros. Um, a quantum bit is a superposition, so this is kind of when we put them all together. Um, superposition of values zero and one. Um, so we're creating some linear combination of things, and that's when something is both values at the same time. Um, with measurement or with noise, we can collapse this superposition. And what's interesting about it is um, sometimes we'll get a zero out and sometimes we'll get a one out. And yet we can set the same superposition up over and over again and sometimes get a one and sometimes get a zero and not really know what's going to happen. So um, a cool thing, like I'm really interested in alternative computing architectures. When I was younger, I thought about, you know, you could make a computer out of anything. You could make it out of beer cans. You could make it out of ant farms. Um, so now I make it out of uh, particle spins and polarizations of photons and things like that, um, which is probably better than the time I thought of making a computer out of many cats. So. <laughs> um, 
It's also more useful because you can't, well, no, we're not going to go down that path, but um, okay, so you have, you have n qubits. Let's say you have three qubits. Um, this is equivalent to classically something like, and it's not completely equivalent, but let's go with it. Um, this can represent something like two to the n complex coefficients. So to kind of break that down, we can look at the diagram up there. Um, you have a three qubit register, and you have, you know, three, zero, one, zero, and one, zero, and one. You can actually represent two to the three values, so the binary um, digits, you can get eight. So this is kind of interesting when you have three qubits, but it quickly scales. Um, so this is one of my favorite kind of uh, thought experiments about quantum computing, which is, um, so let's say you have a 64 qubit quantum computer, keeping in mind that a qubit can be like a particle of light. Um, so 64 qubits, you know, you could easily fit this in your hand, right, and much smaller than that, um, would be 18 quintillion parallel operations. Um, if we were to run that on conventional supercomputers as of a couple years ago, this would cover something on the order of 750 trillion acres um, with supercomputers, which would give us computing clusters covering the surface of 5,000 Earths. So I'm really inspired by thinking about covering 5,000 Earths in supercomputers and running them until the heat death of the universe, and it turns out we don't have to. <laughs> so... <laughs> I don't know why my research grants get turned down. <laughs> All right. So there's seven stages. This is, so the reference to this is, I don't know, I'd have to get back to you. Um, but the reference to this is a paper by Dvorak and Scholkopf um, that was published in, I think, Science a few years ago. And this is basically, we have seven stages to get from like having a particle of light to having a large scale quantum computer that can do some crazy stuff. So the first thing is we have to have a qubit, and we have to be able to do stuff to it. Um, the second thing is we have to be able to do a lot of stuff to a lot of qubits. Um, then we have to be able to correct our mistakes. After that, we need to be able to keep that data in memory. After that, we need to be able to deploy a quantum algorithm on at least one qubit. After that, we have to be able to do it on a lot of qubits. And then after that, we have to be able to deal with some of these noise and fault tolerance issues that I kind of alluded to before. So. We've thought about qubits. We've thought about this basic thing that we make a quantum computer out of, and we then take the qubits and we construct quantum gates. So this is when we configure um, our qubits so that we can perform logical operations. So if we think back, um, when I put up that slide a while back that I stole from Scott Aronson, sorry about that, um, we had several matrices that corresponded to um, these different quantum mechanical ideas. Um, and as we can see here, um, the matrices that we have um, correspond to these quantum gates. Now what's great is these are unitary matrices, so if that means anything to you, you know that there's certain things we can compute, um, whereas probabilistically we have a different kind of matrix and the math becomes less powerful. Um, maybe that's not the best explanation, but let's go with it. Uh, quantum circuits are composed of reversible, and this is very important, quantum gates like those listed on the left, um, and they allow us to do a range of basic operations for an n qubit register. So in the same way, well, not quite the same, but in a very similar and analogous way to how we build up circuits on our, um, our conventional computing hardware, we can build up quantum circuits as well out of our qubits that construct gates that construct circuits. So what does a quantum computer look like? Um, it can look like many things. So interestingly, the qubits are very small, but the machines are very big. Um, so here are several different implementations. Um, you will notice that D-Wave is listed here. Um, I will not say too much one way or the other, other than that it is a different type or suspected to be a different type of quantum computing than what we think about when we think about the really powerful quantum computers that could, you know, break our cryptography or whatever it is. So D-Wave is very important um, for things like uh, quantum annealing, so op optimization problems, and it can be applied to perhaps machine learning. Um, but when we think about um, the really powerful um, novel approaches to quantum computing, it's probably likely to be a different type of implementation. So when I proposed this talk, um, I've never really talked about quantum programming languages in a public fora before, so I hope it's going well. Um, <laughs> um, when, I, when I proposed this, I just thought it's kind of like a beautiful topic to think about um, 
You know, you have this, you have a qubit, you have something that is a manifestation of the laws of physics, and that's really beautiful. Um, and then you apply some operations to it um, to perform a computation, and you effectively exert control over the universe to the um, fullest extent possible to get some output that is determined by the laws of quantum physics. I think this is beautiful. Um, but maybe if beauty isn't your thing, or... Um, if you're like, why am I listening to this? Because um, this is, I'll never use this. Um, maybe the thing that we can take away from it in a more applied context is um, by understanding how we can build up a quantum computer from lowest to highest levels of abstraction, um, you offer yourselves an opportunity perhaps in the future. So when we think about very expensive quantum computers, we can also think about um, the likelihood that they're going to be available as a sort of... Um, I'm not sure how to, how to phrase it. Something, some computational resource that you could rent time on um, and make use of for your own specific computational tasks. You wouldn't have a quantum computer at home. So in understanding that there are ways of building up to quantum algorithms and implementing these on quantum computers, yet having fully classical interfaces and fully classical um, ways of programming them, we can then start to understand how we as um, you know, any kind of programmer that you may have trying to solve any kind of computational problem that is perhaps relevant here um, could make use of these resources. So you don't have to be a strange physicist to get the strange physics. Um, so quantum programming language research, um, we're largely looking at um, higher level formalism. So we have our algorithms that we can run on a quantum computer. And when we're talking about programming languages, a lot of what's come out is ways of articulating those algorithms. Um, so it also involves things like um, a, a little bit lower level controls of how you're going to manipulate the qubits and then things like compiler design. Um, now this becomes very challenging because we have to figure out, like we've learned from classical computing and programming languages um, about, you know, programming languages that weren't ready in time for the hardware. So let's learn from our mistakes. We need to figure out what the semantics are of the programming language before the quantum hardware becomes available. Um, but this is really hard, because as we saw in the image a few slides ago, um, there's many different things that quantum computing could turn into. There's many different competing um, and diverse application areas, and we don't know which will be the first to scale or which ones are capable of scaling. So it's very hard at this, at this point. Now, why do we care about any of this at all? So these are the, I think these are really important um, application areas. These are the ones that never show up on a grant proposal. Um, and I'll show you why shortly. So <laughs> um, one of the things is quantum simulation. So we think back to Richard Feynman, um, a very famous physicist of a few decades ago. Um, he was talking about, you know, uh, chips are getting smaller and smaller and we're keeping, you know, we're increasing the amount of processors that we can, um, fit on a piece of uh, computational real estate, and this is really cool. But the problem with this is we hit a fundamental physical limit, which is eventually quantum effects start to come into play and mess up our chips. Um, but what's nice is maybe we can turn it around, you know, maybe we can make a victory story out of this. What if we harness those quantum effects to do something useful and to do something interesting? Um, so the first application area of this was quantum simulations. This was um, thinking about, you know, a lot of the universe. Um, we think about it classically, but perhaps it could be better understood quantumly. Um, how can we simulate a quantum system? And what could this mean for er various areas of science? Um, similar way of turning it around is metrology. We have very sensitive systems, but this is very good for performing precise measurements. Um, we've also found that even quantum annealing, so the more readily available um, forms of quantum computing today are very useful for certain kinds of optimization problems. And we see similar applications in material science, quantum chemistry, and um, debatably perhaps machine learning. So for example, when I talk about these quantum subroutines that we could all perhaps run once our computers scale up, um, machine learning is doing this right now. So um, there's a quantum algorithm that exists that gives us a quadratic speed up on the search of large unstructured databases. And um, this algorithm is called Grover's algorithm. And people are using it within machine learning algorithms to speed up um, those application areas. So this is something that analogously we could perhaps do on very interesting computational problems in the future. But this is really not the sexy thing. This is not what you get interviewed about in the news. This is not 
where my research funding comes from. So why do we really think about quantum computing? And that is we could break the internet with uh, this circuit right here. So this is what a quantum circuit looks like um, for Shor's algorithm. Some of you may have heard of this, if not, um, Welcome. So Shor's algorithm um, was written, uh, the first paper was written in 1994, and it's essentially a quantum algorithm that can be used to provide exponential speed up on the factoring of large numbers into their component primes. Um, why this is interesting is because most of the, almost all of the public key cryptography widely used on the internet today, so this would be RSA, this would be elliptic curve cryptography, um, is based upon this mathematical problem, um, or specifically the hardness of this mathematical problem. But this specific circuit, this single circuit that lays before us, um, if implemented, could um, dramatically improve our computation times for solving this. And what that means is you have your public key and you have your secret key. And in fact, from the public key with this circuit, um, with some implementation of large-scale quantum computing, you can get the secret key back. What this means is at some level we break the internet or any of the internet that requires any level of privacy or integrity or um, authentication. So um, it becomes very powerful and this is maybe the most interesting uh, application area of quantum computing. Now, to me, crypt cryptanalysis is really just thinking about um, what are the kinds of problems that computers cannot solve? So we've always thought of computers as one single thing, but now that we have quantum computers, we have to think about what are the kinds of problems that a quantum computer cannot solve. And in doing so, that's how we'll find the replacement for all of the cryptography that we have right now. So when we talk about unsolvable problems, and I think I'm running over time, so don't worry, I'm almost done. Um, when we talk about the difficulty of computational problems, um, this comes right back to... Um, cryptography and cryptanalysis. So when we think about quantum computational complexity, um, some of you may be familiar with um, the notions of P and NP um, and whether problems are efficiently computable. Um, and what, what quantum computing fundamentally presents to us is an opportunity to find problems that are very hard to compute with a classical computer and very easy on a quantum computer, and this is very exciting. Um, so maybe I'll leave it here, um, just finishing off with why I find existential pleasure in quantum computing. So um, one of the things is just being able to replicate, as I mentioned, the essential properties of the universe and hold them in your own soft hands. I think that's, that's a very beautiful and real thing to have happen. Um, the other, and take this as abstractly as you like, is quantum systems teach us that sensitivity is a source of power. Um, it also teaches us that true randomness um, can present opportunities for a well-lived life that we've never seen before. So when we can create many different computational paths, we find that um, our universe becomes much bigger and our problems become much smaller. Um, and I like to take that home with me. Um, one of the things that I love most about quantum computing is we can solve problems um, that otherwise couldn't be computed before the heat death of the universe, and I'll still be here when it's over. And then finally, <laughs> um, just accepting that what I observe of a system, I set up a state, and what you will observe if you set up the exact same state could collapse and things could be totally different from each other, and it's really important to remember this. So um, these, I guess, are the reasons that I wake up in the morning, and thank you for letting me share them. <laughs>